Hello and welcome to another episode of Earth 911's Sustainability in Your Ear, the podcast conversation about accelerating the transition to a sustainable carbon neutral society. I'm your host, Mitch Ratcliffe, and thank you for joining the conversation. You know, I was fortunate to be an early tech journalist, and I had the opportunity to report on and participate in the digital revolution. The path to the circular economy is following a similar trajectory. Society is moving from sustainability naive to sustainability native. That'll be an era in which the practices and value values of sustainable thinking will be taken for granted. And it's then, when we have a shared language, that changes really start to happen. Our guest today, Solitaire Townsend, is the author of The Solutionists, How Business Can Fix the Future. And it's a guide to the many threads of transformation that are already weaving the circular economy, albeit often behind closed doors and never as fast as all of us would like. As in the digital transition, when the early scaffolding of the technology and the new economy uh, were conducted and and developed in computer science departments and among IT teams at universities in the 1960s and 70s, and then for two decades, companies worked to ingest all this complex engineering-centric information into the standards that we used to really deliver the PC as a true media platform. All of that was the preface to the beginning of the real digital transformation. And then over the following 20 years, from about the time the web appeared in 1993 to around 2010, the engineering language started to fade and be replaced by a common nomenclature as the web, the iPod, the iPhone, and other technologies became commonplace. The Solutionist documents how a similar change is underway in companies and governments. Today's debates about the value of ESG reporting, for instance, and what factors it should account for, whether only the financial risk faced by companies or the full spectrum of environmental impacts a company or country creates, is an example of the debates that would be familiar to participants in the digital revolution. We talked about privacy. We talked about how to uh, manage uh, social media and transparency and identity. All of those things are similar to what we're going through now with the, uh, the environmental transformation. Solitaire recounts hundreds of interviews and projects that show the progress and hope that can lead to a profound change. That's not guaranteed, but as she writes near the end of the book, Being a successful solutionist means stepping up to the conversations that challenge you with an openness to learn. It's an uncomfortable time, and the curious, driven leader can make vast change real for their organization and their communities. You can find the solutionists at Amazon, Powell's Books, and local bookstores, and we'll include links in the article that accompanies this podcast so you can find them. Let's get into the conversation. Welcome to the show, Solitaire. How are you doing today? Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you so much. I'm doing very well. I'm in very rainy London, England. Well, it's good to have rain these days uh, after the droughts that we've been suffering there <laughs> here in uh, the, the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we're, it, fall is welcome. I, I want to start off by asking you about what a solutionist is. You say that a solutionist needs to be a little odd. Why is that? <laughs> so um, I've been working in this field. I've been working to try to create social and environmental solutions for I mean, my third decade now. And we never really had a collective noun. We were change makers or sustainability people or, 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 or chief sustainability officers or activists even. And I wanted a word that really reflected the world, the world that we're in right now which is trying to find solutions to the challenges of the 21st century in many ways. Um, and at the beginning of the of the book, I actually I call solutionists curious in both sense of the ways. They are kind of strange people. Um, they're not representative of the norm, mainly in their positivity and enthusiasm and belief that they can make a difference. That is far too much of a rare attitude these days. Um, there is a, this, you know, a terrible wave of fatalism that's taking over. So they are, they, they're quite strange um, and unusual in that way. But they're also intensely curious about the world around them. So it's actually quite hard to interview them because they end up asking me as many questions as I ask them. Well, you know, during the introduction, I compare what we're going through to the transition we did with digital. And and a lot Mm -hmm. of it started with, you know, university people working on this, and then it went into IT teams and companies, and then it reached all of us in a variety of different ways. Mm -hmm. This also implies that essentially a solution is is an outsider, at least intellectually. Mm -hmm. How do you you get over that wall, so to speak? 
So for now, um, and actually, I think we've got a lot of insider outsiders um, who are beginning to to emerge. So you know, again, going back, you know, twenty thirty years, um, you know, you get called a hippie, you'd get called a sort of um, a bleeding heart, all of these different terms of really kind of being an outsider and trying to have these conversations inside business you know you know people would go oh yeah go and talk to our philanthropy department you know who could sort of you know do these uh, corporate donations actually solutionists mainly sit on the cusp now between some of these um uh, uh, uh edgy ideas about how we transform our systems about how we bring um uh, equity into our systems about how we uh, transform our energy and and the inside where there's increasing pressure being felt around what's happening on the outside. So I find that most of the solutionists that I work with, they can straddle. They have got a foot in this very big visionary thinking about what's next for the world and a foot in the deep reality of today. And that's what makes them effective. You you, you provide a very concrete example of a personal transformation mm-hmm. early in the book, uh, which I think is a applicable to the lives of all of our listeners as well. And that was the intrinsic challenge of embracing a fully vegetarian lifestyle as a cat owner. Mm-hmm. Why was that a challenge? And how did looking at it from a solutionist perspective help you solve the problem? Yeah. So, uh you know, I'm a cat person. Actually, I'm a pet person. <laughs> um, and I'm, you know, I'm a lifelong environmentalist. I've been working in this field since I was 13. And over the years, those things became quite challenging. I couldn't, as I became more and more committed to living a lower impact lifestyle, trying to be more vegan and more plant based, and then putting down this this quite large bowl of meat every day for my cat and cats are obligate carnivores so um, you can actually have a healthy vegetarian dog if you put some real effort into it and it takes some work but you can do it you can't with a cat they can't there's a set of amino acids they can't produce they must take from other um, animals and so you know what you'd find coming out of things like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, who look at this purely through a scientific view, is we are going to have to have less pets. And I'm going, yeah, but do I really want to live in that world? It's right. like a sustainable world has got to be what I actually want to live in. And the sustainable future I want to live in has got, you know, fur babies in it. It's got, it's got dogs, it's got cats, it's got rabbits, it's got the this other life forms who live with us in our homes. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And so rather than either sort of just saying, no, um, it's fine, meat for animals is fine, it's all off cuts, it's absolutely perfectly fine. So denying its problem or going, right, that's it, we can't have any more pets, so doing this massive sacrifice, a solutionist finds this middle way. So it doesn't deny that something is a problem. It is a problem, a quarter of the um uh meat produced by humanity is fed to pets that's not an okay or sustainable thing plus recognizing the fact of going we don't want to sacrifice we want to live in a beautiful wonderful future and so how are you going to fix it and so after doing some research and didn't have to do that much to be honest um i came across insect protein now lots of people talk about insect protein for humans of course insects are eaten absolutely normally as part of a diet in parts of the world um i don't want to eat them because that's how i'm vegetarian but um i know i already knew my cat would be perfectly fine eating insects because she eats them all the time it's actually you know literally she bashes herself up against the window whenever there's a fly in the house and so i took a look into insect protein it's really good quality protein very high quality protein in the way that it is um farmed and you know there's insect farms that are within buildings um it's high hypoallergenic um and actually sort of emotionally it feels like a much more natural thing for a cow to be eating than a cow i don't know about you but i haven't ever seen a sort of group of little kitties bring down a cow or go fishing for a tuna (laughs) well now we've actually talked with a number of companies that do insect protein particularly for uh, dog and cat food so and it's 99 percent less impactful it's it's really now How did that kind of personal experience translate into what you've been doing with various companies for the past yeah. several years? So um, my view is that we need to use business and we need to enthuse and inspire business to be part of the solution here. So rather than going and setting up my own company um, to try to make this happen, I was like, right. I work with Mars. Mars Pet Care is one of the biggest pet food owners in, in the world. And um, they're very aware of what's going on in the outside world. You know, they do their sustainability report, et cetera. So I actually went and pitched that pitch to Mars, do this in, in partnership together. 
and that uh, we would bring the branding and the consumer insight. We do a lot of the go-to-market, a lot of the direct-to-consumer marketing. But Mars would actually work on a insect best pet food that met the criteria of the rest of their food in terms of health and nutrition, um, et cetera. And so that's, that's a real solutionist thing to do, which is to sort of go, I want scale. I don't want this to be an alternative, something that's sold just online, something that is... Um, that, that that you can only get through sort of health food shops. I want this on the on the on the shelves of Walmart. This needs to become something where in five years' time, love bug isn't anything special anymore because actually insect protein is being used across um, uh, a whole set of brands. And of course, by doing it with Mars, and once they've done all that experiment and all of that work and all of that R and D, of course they're going to use it across other brands because uh, you know that's how large companies work. So as a solutionist, what I was looking for was a solution that meant that I could get what I want, which is cats in a sustainable future, was something which could scale really quickly, which was about partnering with a large company to make it happen, um, and which was easy to communicate. And so we pulled together all of our branding and expertise in Futera. It's something which we do a lot of to create this new brand, Love Bug. And the branding won so many awards, you know, it was Pet Food Launch of the Year, blah, 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 blah. And that's and, and now it's actually gone to Mars, and Mars are taking this forward now, and they're scaling it, and, you know, it will be coming to a shelf near you. And this is how we should approach the problems that we look at. Not deny them or give up, but find a solution. Well, and, and as you point out, a quarter of the meat that we produce today are fed to our pets. If we could eliminate that, that's about 5% of our, our, our collective carbon footprint right there. Whenever, whenever I'm having arguments with someone who very, very, very strongly wants to keep eating meat, I'm like, you should be a massive proponent for insect-based pet food because uh, I absolutely- You can eat a little meat. Yeah, right? that, 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 that means there's gonna be more available for human beings. Well, and, and these trade-offs are really interesting uh, to, to consider. I mean, a lot of the times we get very absolutist about this. And you yes. make the point that companies are, are not evil. They're just slower to break their ignorance because of their financial stake in the, in the ideas that they built their business on. How can we reframe that conflict to enable conversations and solutions? Absolutely. So, so much of this is about language. Like, I find myself having conversations with people who don't get on with businesses and then with activists. And you know, actually the only difference in the conversation is the terminology used, the, the pressures, the need to change, the, the commitment to change, the trying to find solutions is exactly the same, but everybody's using a different language. And in business, I do a lot of sessions with this. Then you know, at Futera, we've just trained up, I think, our 60,000th person inside companies on this, is we talk about entrepreneurial solves. So actually, managerial solves aren't going to get us there. Managerial solves are about trying to save like 2% of energy every year. It's really important. We need to keep doing that. But that is mainly about trying to make the status quo slightly better. We need entrepreneurial solves, big, bold bets that companies make um, and that they go into a sort of a, a, a commitment with their consumers that together we're going to try to make this 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 change. And actually that really excites a lot of CEOs because there isn't a lot of elbow room. Like it is all about 2% margins on the previous year. And actually this idea of doing something which is bolder and more entrepreneurial is really, really attractive. And I also talk about the fact that you've got to get your lifeboats ready. There are some parts of your industry, there's use of plastic, there's um, a, a food waste, there's um, fossil fuels, there's significant parts of, of your business which simply won't exist within 10 years. So what's your lifeboat? How are you preparing for that? Again, rather than rather than denying it and saying it's not going to happen or just giving up and saying that's the next dude's job he'll you know the next person and they're always men of course the next person down the line will get that sorted out actually how how am I going to fix this and and how am I going to make myself famous for being the person who bought the solve well and, and that isn't actually unusual every mm. needs a lifeboat because 40 percent of the fortune 500 literally goes out of business every decade yeah. It's not like exactly. we're asking you to do something new. It's pursuing the next opportunity. Absolutely. And, and also kind of welcome to capitalism, folks. It's like, this is how it works. When market shocks and market changes came, and Mitch, you used the, the, the example of the digital economy so well. I mean, everyone says change isn't possible. We literally lived through one. 
think we we the, like I I tried to think about how did we do things like you know I was quite old when this all happened and I find it difficult to even remember how we got things done before um before the scenario we went we've lived through a change and yet we deny that change is possible and Devil. I say to several and I say to CEOs this is like you know those CEOs back in the day who would have their emails printed out for them and then they'd dictate the the, the answer to their secretary who would then type it out those guys did not stay around very long yeah. <laughs> they were put out to pasture far before their time because they did not pivot into the market context changing and that's exactly where we are right now with sustainability now, you described five mindsets that you think are, are effective ways to break through the intellectual and organizational resistance to change. Yeah. Can you summarize them briefly? I know yeah. I, people can read the book to get the whole story. Yeah, please, please, please read the book. I'll, I'll, I'll go through all of them, but I'll, I'll focus on a couple. So one is a clear vision. We need to have people who really, really understand where they're trying to get there. But perhaps more importantly than vision actually is flex, flexibility. So that's the second one. I go into flexibility in quite a lot of detail because we become very, very um, uh, uh, connected to our solutions, to what our answer is, what our fix is. And sometimes we forget why we're doing it. So I go a lot into the need to have what I call a Mississippi mind. The Mississippi always makes its way down to the Gulf of Mexico, but it takes different routes and it meanders and sometimes it needs us to change direction. And so actually really trying to think through that, 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 that adaptable mindset, which is really, really what we need as we face ever more complex and unanticipated challenges. I talk about grit grit and tenacity um so many of the solutionists that i met although they're flexible very flexible in terms of how they get there they never ever ever give up and i think that by the way as someone who's got a uh, american mom and a british dad i think that's really really part of um sort of american culture is that tenacity and grit and i'd like to see a great deal more of that um uh in, Always in, assume in how life. we talk <laughs> I've always assumed that factor is why Winston Churchill was such a great man. Exactly, exactly. Just, just, just bulldog it out. Um, then I talk um, about fun, and actually, you know, there's a lot of doom and negativity, and 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 sort of, you know, the fact that that we talk ourselves into sort of misery around these issues. Again, climate doesn't care if we're having fun whilst we solve it or we're miserable. Like literally, our attitude makes no difference to our impact. The only the only thing our attitude affects is us. And so all the solutionists that I met were overall extraordinarily optimistic people, even though they probably have more detailed knowledge of exactly what the challenges are and where they are and how deep they are than the average population. When I surveyed the average population about their optimism versus the solutionists, the solutionists came out as being much, much, much more positive. And every single interview that I did, there must have been like we had to stop them so many times over because people were just laughing at themselves at the situations that they've been in. But perhaps the word of the five, so if you've got sort of like vision, flexibility, you've got grit, you've got fun, but perhaps the fifth word is the one that I thought the longest about and I wrote down and scribbled out and wrote down and scribbled out. And that is soul, S-O-U-L. Um, and soul with a small s, if that makes sense in terms of religious context. But the fact that these are people who don't hide why they're doing this. They don't dress it up. Um, as being something that's not they are passionate about making a difference they aren't embarrassed to be authentic and to to say that they're trying to save the world they will talk about some of the horrors and challenges and difficulties that, that, that they've seen and um i could have used other terms i could have used progressive i could have used woke i could have used bleeding heart i could have used um socially aware any terminology but i used soul because actually that's what it feels like when you talk to solutionists when you talk to some of these amazing entrepreneurs and change makers activists and leaders um and when you are having a conversation with them that that's what comes through. These these are people who are living authentically by what they want to see happen in the world. And in some ways, for me, that's where it starts. And that's the hard bit as well. I, I thought soul was really a great way to ground this in the reality rather than the ideology of mm -hmm. this. Uh, it is about we've decided we want to change and let's get there. Now, the doomism that we we deal with every day, 
uh, is often described as a poly crisis. Do you think that's <laughs> the best time to make comprehensive changes, or does that actually all those fractures that we're talking about create greater resistance as people defend their turf? Oh, both. But when you look through some of the um, uh, historical moments, the axial ages, when big, big, big changes happened, they positive changes, they almost always happen in times of fracture. Because, you know, as the quote is, that's how the light gets in. But but we need a lot of the expe- accepted ways of doing things through being questioned. Now, they're often being questioned in a bad way or being challenged or things which are which are valuable are being um, undervalued. But that's a sign that everybody is ready for a change. Um, and uh, I talk about it as the crossroads, that we're kind of at a crossroads at the moment where a whole load of bets are off, a whole load of expectations, a whole load of things which we grew up with aren't necessarily the way that, that they are, that aren't accepted as just a given anymore um and we could go one or other way like it like it's not guaranteed that we're going to go towards a more sustainable set of solutions we have to work very 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 hard to do so but i think it's very hard to make this kind of change when everything is tickety boo as we say when everything is fine and everybody's comfortable and nobody's got any questions and nobody's trying to challenge orthodoxy, it's actually very difficult to make change. It's scary to make change when everything's up in the air because, of course, you're not the only people trying to make change. There's other people who are trying to make change in a different direction, but it's the only way to do it. So, yes, there are entrenched positions. There are people who are who are fighting. About, the, the fossil fuel industry particularly right. is, is fighting as a very strong rearguard action, but it's fighting a rearguard action because it's scared which it really wasn't a decade or two ago. Well, the question is, there are they the 40% that go away or are they the for, part of the 40, the 60% that transform into something renewable and sustainable? And, and, and it's not clear. This is a really great conversation. I want to take a quick <laughs> and be right back. Now let's get back to the conversation with Solitaire Townsend. She's the author of The Solutionists, How Businesses Can Fix the Future. Now, what we're talking about is not simply an environmental transition, but one in which equity figures mm-hmm. significantly in the path to a new world in which, you know, the in it for myself approach to resource acquisition and ownership can give way to some form of cooperation and participation. And I do think within the framework of, of what we describe as capitalism, but how does equity figure in a solutionist perspective? What do you need to be thinking about? So um, for a start, I couldn't agree with you more. Like people don't understand that around the world, the um, overt capitalism that you and I live within isn't the accepted paradigm. So more people are employed by cooperatives in India than by privately held companies. Like more people work, more people are employees of cooperatives where they own part of their, um, the business that they work for than, um, than capitalist organizations. We do have a whole set of really, really exciting um, uh, uh, precedent. And, you know, one of the things which, you know, I'm often thinking about is, you know, how do we make that transition in a way that's full stack? So I talk in the book about full stack self. So full stack is a terminology that I took from tech. And I love the fact that tech and the digital world is a theme of this whole conversation. And full stack solve is basically when you've thought about what the front page of the website looks like, what the coding looks like, what the database looks like, what the back end of the website looks like. You as you as a as a as a coder, you can do the full stack. You can actually make make a single solution. And that's what I think about in terms of being a solutionist. You can solve for environmental challenges in a way that also solves for for social challenges. Because if you do the opposite, and if you try to solve for environmental challenges in a way that worsens social challenges, it's simply not a solve and it won't stick. I, I love the full stack analogy as I was reading it. I was thinking about this and, and I covered a lot of the evolution of what we describe as the internet stack today. So mm-hmm. what was key about it is that new layers of the stack could emerge and be integrated into the system. And, you know, I've talked with a lot of CEOs and analysts and authors and, and so forth. And all, all of them agree that one to 2% of the extractive economy is going to shift to circularity, which creates the opportunity for a lot of that new commercial engagement that we're talking about. How do you think capitalism has to change for human society to survive and thrive? And I know, of course, authors have been writing about this for 400 years now, (laughs) but it's your turn. 
Okay, so, for ex you know, hang on to your britches. Let, let me hit you with something. So if you think about all through human history, we've organized ourselves in different ways. And particularly sitting here in England, we've seen most of them. So we've organized ourselves in a feudal way where, where basically who you were when you were born is how things get organized. We've tried to organize ourselves in a communist um, way in which there's no difference between people's status. And actually what capitalism came, in, came along and did, which particularly if you used to live in feudalism, was brilliant, was to say, actually, depending on how smart you are, depending on how much you can acquire, your status in, in society isn't dependent on, on who your dad was. Now, of course, that's not how it actually works. And there is a deep, 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 deep inequity built in, and we are not a meritocracy, although on paper, um, capitalism should do that. And capitalism has been brilliant. I would far prefer to live in capitalism than in feudalism, not least because I grew up poor, and that would have meant in feudalism that I'd have ended up going and scrubbing somebody rich's toilet. So really, really, really happy with a system within which if you are able and if you if you are lucky, there are ways in which you can um, uh, secure freedoms. There are significant barriers within that. Capitalism does not work the way that it's supposed to. It is still partly feudal. That people, some people have said we've got feudal capitalism increasingly, particularly with inherited wealth. But how does capitalism move forward? Because capitalism promised us that we could organize ourselves in terms of accumulating stuff and that we could just keep extracting resources and that we could keep increasing our quality of life by extracting resources and the economy would work around to do that. Um, so a couple of things we've forgotten. One is the economy works for us. The economy works for us. And we often talk about the economy as if we work for it. And I, I, I often come up with a quote, which is the market. When we think about the market, the market is a terrific servant. It's actually, a, it's a great way to organize and serve humanity. It is a terrible boss, if if you allow it to set. And it is a terrifying God in terms of you, if you actually follow the market as if it were somehow um, uh, natural rather than creative. Or telling you something. Or Rather telling you something. That's reflecting what you want. is the, it, I, That's exactly. such an important difference. We invented this whole thing. We invented it. Adam Smith wrote it. It's like there's nothing God given about any of it. So the, the, at the heart of capitalism, you've got two problems. One is it was supposed to be a meritocracy and it isn't. So we have got to try to pluck feudalism out of capitalism. So the whole point, by the way, it's what your country was founded on, was the attempt to pluck feudalism out of society. So if you could finish that job off, that would be great. Um, and then on the second side, we cannot have um, everlasting um, resource extraction, which again, the founders of capitalism didn't realise were going to be an issue. They lived in a very, very, very big world in which humans were a very, very small part. And so the idea that there would be any kind of limits to, to that you know limits to labor yes limits to capital yes but they never realized that there was going to be limits to resources what does that mean well it means that we can keep capitalism but we're going to have to base it not on the accumulation of stuff but on the accumulation of something else maybe on the accumulation of social credit maybe on the accumulation of online stuff i'm very interested in the fact that um although as we move online we, we don't become any nicer our footprints can actually go down in terms of if we're more interested in accumulating online stuff than real world stuff it basically means we are going to have to think very 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 differently about capitalism or we lose it and i'm not one of those people who think that sweeping capitalism away is a good idea unless we have a clear alternative because i tell you what happens if you if you sweep it away without a clear alternative feudalism which is always bubbling just under the surface and we can see the heads of it now with the billionaire class who are the kings of the modern world it will come back and we will all then be doing what our parents did and we won't get a chance to do anything new so let's let's think about do we want to save capitalism do we want to replace capitalism but we definitely definitely don't want feudalism well we've always had a mixed economy and, and really, how do we recalibrate that mix? Now, you talked about the idea of a dematerialized economy. And, and we pointed out that there's a transition to services, services economics going on. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, for instance, if you look at the iPhone, the iPhone used to make money on the hardware. Now it mm -hmm. makes money on the services that are attached to the iPhone. And 
do you see that as a, a, the key or the initial catalyst for a circular, equitable, and restorative economy? Is, circular, is, 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 yes. The things that we do, the experience yeah. we deliver, rather than the stuff we get. Yeah. So I think that in terms of the in terms of the environmental impact, yes, I think there's a lot of work to think about the equitable and and uh, restorative part of that. So somebody asked me the other day, what's the most sustainable thing that they can do? And I said, sit down and play a computer game. Like as long as your home is renewably powered and you're playing a game that's being um, powered on a um, on a renewably powered uh, data center, which increasingly many of them are, that's probably one of the most sustainable ways to spend your time. Like I'd love to do the um, uh, the life cycle analysis of a book versus a computer game. I suspect a computer game might even actually come out slightly better. So the entertainment economy is part of this as well. Yeah. As we as we spend more time consuming entertainment, as we spend more time gaming, as we spend more time um, uh, our, our participating participating in online environments, educating ourselves online, and, and that becomes more important to us. That becomes more important to us than our, uh, the stuff we acquire. There is, and many, many people are, are talking about this, and lots of people then go to me, well, yeah, but doesn't the digital economy have a really big footprint? And it's like, it does, but it has such an easy footprint to solve. Like compared yeah. to trying to dematerialize the fashion industry with billions of nodes of content being created with thousands, hundreds of thousands of factories, I'd far prefer to stick a wind turbine on top of a data center. Like really, really, really big energy sucks that sit in one place. <laughs> much, much easier to decarbonize the massively convoluted supply chains across the entire world. So I'm excited about it. I don't think you and I will live in it because we grew up in a world where the acquisition of stuff was very much the definition of status, you know, keeping up with the Joneses were. But actually, I think perhaps some of the 12 to 13 year olds who are out there who lived through the pandemic, where the online world was more important to them than anything else, where they felt safe and connected, where the online world was the only place where where they could meet their friends. I think that generation may find online experiences, online acquisition, um, much, much, much more uh, satisfying than just having lots of stuff. Well, it's a multi-generational project. And unfortunately, a lot of us want it all now. <laughs> and, and that simply isn't the right way to think about this. So, you know, and, and when we hear about the climate crisis, that is perceived as the negative pitch uh, that we have to do this or else. What's the best way to sell sustainability in the, in the marketing or in the uh, political sense? Uh, so, you know, I don't in any way want to distract from the, the urgency and necessity to change in terms sure. of climate change. Like that is an absolute given. But if we wait until that urgency is so completely serious that it's bad enough that our politicians will act, we may have gone too far. So uh, and people go, oh, we just need a couple more natural disasters and go like we've had quite a few folks like, you know, we've burned up the West Coast. It's like we, we, we that people are dying right now and it isn't creating change fast enough. So what is going to and I, I believe human beings have a great deal more energy to, over time to run towards what they want rather than to run away from what they don't. You know, fight or flight is a very immediate uh, experience we're not very good at our own survival we smoke we drink we drive cars we we have high cholesterol we're not actually very good at our long-term survival what we're, we're very good at frankly <laughs> what we're very good at is working towards what we want so um i tend to talk about one well, than talk about solving climate change i tend to talk about the massive benefits of a renewable economy so world around, around the world right now we use about 17 to 18 terawatts of energy that's everything the coal the oil the nuclear the renewables the dung the kerosene the charcoal it all comes to between 17 and 18 terawatts and that's about it that's about the maximum that humanity will be able to get access to there's only so much coal and oil there's only so much that you can build one petawatt um, of energy hits the planet every single day so imagine a world where we don't just have access to 18 terawatts of energy. We have access to 20, 25, 30, 50 terawatts of energy. The world we're heading to is significantly better than the world we're in at the moment. A world where um, uh, the concept of poverty, this awful, awful, hideous um, horror that we see around us of people who simply don't have enough to live, energy input could solve that. In terms of entertainment, in terms of stress, in terms of having access to time with our family, we're going to be healthier. We're going to live longer. We're going to have better sex lives. It's like literally 
be when you think about all the changes we need to make to our lifestyles and to our systems in order to solve climate change it solves everything else and it's that that positive vision of what we could get that so few people know is even for the taking so i'm very good at selling that to companies and they see that they that there is this very 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 bold future of which they could be part of and they can see there's losers and they can see that there's winners we've really really got to get that story to people as well energy abundance yields so much prosperity and it's something that we fail to recognize partly because the companies that currently provide us energy are very much about taking as much out of our pockets as possible mm -hmm. to give us the energy but when you're talking about 100 200 percent solar and wind production compared to today's energy levels that's a lot to, to spread around and it's a lot less expensive it is and it's also when you look around the world when you think about what's happening you know um, last year china brought on well more um renewable capacity than the entire consumption of my country it's it's this is happening rapidly and some of the economies which are dominant at the moment in in the eu and in the us like need to catch up very 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 quickly and we need to stop seeing this as some sort of socially positive thing that we're doing almost in a philanthropic approach and start seeing it as deeply competitive um, because access to energy and how much energy you have is going to become all about renewables because of course um uh renewable you know here in the uk you know we have a very abundant uh wind uh so much so that we could adequately uh power our entire country plus some and it's this is you know it can you can own it you can have it in in your own country you do not have to import it like this is going to be a very 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 significant change over the next couple of years and also like I'm not sure about you but I've been up mountains in the Himalayas and into um uh, sub-Saharan Africa there's no way those folks are ever getting on a grid powered by a coal power station you're going to have to carry those solar panels on your head up those mountains and that's exactly what people are doing it's always been interesting to me that Africa, for instance, never had a physical tele telecommunications infrastructure. They had a wireless one. And that reflects the kind of trend that you're talking about, is that the virtualization and distribution of, of generation is inevitable. I, well, it's 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 already happening. I, I Many, many years ago, I worked with British Telecom. Look, we're going back almost 30 years, where there was this big plan to try to wire Africa. And there was all these pictures yeah. of it around a continent. You're talking about a giant continent. Um, uh, and of course, you know, great money was meant to do. It was absolutely impossible to do. And whilst those conversations were happening, whilst people were making those plans across, you know, multiple countries, um, that, that virtual mobile network got set up almost within it i think that's what's happening with renewables you've got a great deal of big planning being made big big sense of how we could get this done and actually the the, the renewables economy is just doing it itself it's just growing and as the cost become lower as this becomes something that becomes within reach of your average consumer which it's still not within reach of most of us to actually go out there and buy a panel and put it on our home but when it starts becoming the cost of you know similar to the cost of sort of getting a new kitchen or similar to the cost of getting a new oven that's when you're start going to see like people just choosing to go off grid and the energy companies are going to complain and whinge about it and they're going to try to charge you for making your own energy and, and once enough of us are doing it, I don't think that's going to last very long. It's going to be an interesting time. I, mm -hmm. This is a great discussion. Uh, I, just a couple of questions I want to wrap up with. Is net zero the wrong way to think about where we're going? Or is, because we're talking about a multi-generational undertaking, is mm -hmm. the idea of just getting to, to not emitting more the wrong way to think about this and should we be thinking about reversing the historical damage and maybe even re-greening the entire world as the thing we can do within this century 100 percent. so um i'm really you, you you've seen obviously the stripes um that ed's made that ed hawkins um does so i saw it to ed hawkins who did those stripes in terms of the blue turning to the orange turning to the increasing red and i i asked him would it be possible with the science we've currently got to set out what the stripes would look like in order to actually get back to a a a, a, a homeostasis world with a with a livable climate and he said absolutely he goes we know what that trajectory would look like um so i very much hope he makes it because i believe 
absolutely we should be thinking not just about reversing climate change because that feels like going backwards but just like smashing through it to something better <laughs> it's like let's actually let's actually think about climate change as sort of like this this big monster that stands between us and the prize rather than this monster that that we've got to kill to survive. It's not just that. It's not just a monster that's threatening. It's a monster that stands between us and this massive, massive prize. And it's the prize we need to keep our eye on. Um, and it's that that we're fighting for. And um, we're not just fighting to survive. We're actually fighting to get to a better world. And so I very, very much believe that we should. Should we be using the terminology net zero? The terminology net zero was, was developed for businesses primarily in order to deal with their responsibilities of reducing their um, footprint. I think it's a step forward from carbon neutral, which, of course, you could just sign a big check and be carbon neutral. So I think net zero is definitely a step forward. I think the problem with it is that everyone thinks that that's it. That's enough. And that's the lot. It's like, going, oh, no, 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 no. No, like net, net zero is sort of like the slightly prim and proper cousin um, who's sort of standing there telling you what you should do to be a good and responsible person, standing next to that. We need the really cool cousin standing next to them saying, and this is all the amazing positive solutions you can make as well. And at the, mo at the moment, bringing solutions to market aren't covered in, in net zero at all. And I'm part of a consortium who are trying to do just that. So if solutionists are successful, and I, you must have thought about this. What will the next economy look like? And, and what will it be like to live in that economy? So one of the things which we don't need is a sort of Stepford Wives vision of sustainability where where there's sort of, you know, I was talking to a bunch of Hollywood uh, scriptwriters um, and to some novelists about trying to, to think about some more positive visions rather than the plethora of dystopias we have at the moment. And like, yeah, but they're boring. I'm going, no, 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 it's okay. People can still have affairs and be murdered. <laughs> you can still have like really exciting storytelling set within it. And I'd really recommend people, if you haven't already, to read a, a book um, uh, by Becky Chambers called Psalm for the Wild Built. Psalm for the Wild Built. And she's a beautiful um, science fiction book um, set in a sustainable future, which is very compelling and completely believable. Because rather than focusing on all the technology, she focuses on the intimacy of people's lives and how they feel and their challenges and their progress. And actually, what you know, what's it like for a human being living in a world where it's all been sorted out? Is it any fun? And what, where does the angst come from? So actually, in many ways, you and I lives, our children's lives, our great grandchildren's lives aren't going to be that much different. Everyone's still going to worry about whether people like them. You're still going to love your children. You're still going to argue with your spouse. You're still going to be tired at the end of the day. You're still going to look, have a great meal. You're still going to get on with some of your neighbors and argue with some of the others. It's like actually all the things that make us human will be exactly the same in a sustainable future what will hopefully be the case is that you will not have existential angst about whether your grandchildren are going to make it you will actually be able to focus on your health and your well-being more rather than feel that you're actually having to make some kind of um trade of your health for money which so many of us feel in terms of the lives that we're living um and these these are the things which we need to sell to people rather than the big tech we need to say you're going to sleep better you're going to have more time with your family you're going to look better you're going to you're going to you're going to uh, be thinner um and you're going to feel less angst and anxiety you're going to be less stressed and that's what people they that's what people care about they don't care about you know what generated the electrons which are coming down the pipe to their um to the plug socket they care about what that delivers for them in their life so i don't tend to paint a picture of the technological future i don't tend to talk about what it would look like in terms of the world building <laughs> i tend to talk about how you'll feel in that future which is a hell of a lot better than how you feel right now uh, the environment, your built environment won't be contributing to killing you, for instance. I mean, it's just so important to just rethink this in terms of the positives that we can deliver exactly. to all. Solitary. And positive emotions. So this is all about how people feel. So, so this is like when you're talking to someone who might not be on board with any of this, um, don't don't blind them with science. Don't shout them down with the stats and facts. Ask them about how they want to feel how they how they feel right now and how they'd like to feel in the future and maybe show them how some of the things which we're doing is going to get them there. Solitaire, thank you so much for spending time with us today. It's been fascinating. Thank you so much, Mitch. This has been a great conversation.
We've been speaking with Solitaire Townsend, and she's the author of The Solutionists, How Business Can Fix the Future. You can find the book at Amazon, Powell's Books, and local bookstores. So look for links in the article that accompany this podcast to find it. There are so many useful insights and opportunities to shift our perspectives in the conversation with Solitaire. We barely touched on the dozens of deep examples of solutionist changes that she reports on throughout her book, but we heard some key ideas, and they were change takes vision, a willingness to explore new directions rather than pushing a single idea. That process requires grit, a sense of fun, and the kind of soul that makes good music. Solitaire's reference to the full stack approach, which allows organizations and each of us to layer in new functionality and choices to the way that we live, is critical to understanding the give and take required to negotiate a new way of living that benefits everyone. And as I said in the introduction, that's the process that we're undertaking right now when we start to discuss the environmental benefits of organizations, what ESG means, what sustainability means. All of this dialogue is great for finding that new future. And it's self-evident that the green pivot will be a multi-generational process in which new leaders emerge in business and communities to to deliver a better life based on abundant access to renewable energy, which actually has the capacity to provide two or three times more electricity than all the fossil fuel energy generated annually. That means inexpensive power available to everybody. The future can be bright, if we imagine it that way and pursue it doggedly. And I hope you'll take time to read The Solutionists. For me, it was a great way to spend an evening. I also hope you'll take a moment to share this podcast or any of the others that we've done with on sustainability in your ear with your friends, family, and coworkers. Take a moment, if you would, to write a, a review on your favorite podcast platform. It will help your neighbors find us. Uh, tell them they can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Audible, or any of the places that they look for podcasts. Thanks, folks, for your support. I'm Mitch Ratcliffe. This is Earth 911, and we will be back soon with another Innovator interview. In the meantime, take care of yourself, take care of one another, and let's all take care of this beautiful planet of ours. Have a green day. 